So hello, everyone. Welcome to this interview that I have to admit I'm very excited about. My name is Lina Ceballos. I'm part of the Free Software Foundation Europe, uh, a charity that over the last 20 years has been empowering you to control technology. And um, for the last four years, we have worked on our public money, public cloud uh, initiative uh, that demands that uh, free software should be the standard for publicly financed software. So today we have this story around this, uh, the story around the lack of uh, public card in the public sector, and also some open solutions that was also developed by the public. So I have with me today uh, Christian Landberg and uh, Alexander Crawford, and they will tell us a little bit better uh, about the OpenScore platform, pardon my Swedish, or uh, OpenScore platform. Uh, this is an open uh, platform that it was developed by some parents and I was aimed to fix some issues that was uh, found in the proprietary school that it was developed by the city of um, Stockholm um, and that it cost one million one billion Swedish crown which is 100 million euros if I'm wrong and uh, that it was supposed to make the life of 500,000 children, teachers and parents easier. But that uh, it brought a lot of trouble and even more to the parents who decide to fix it and develop an open alternative that actually works. So this, the plot of this story involves a lot of bureaucratic issues, security problems, a very serious vendor locking, the police and so more. But to tell us the story better, so uh, welcome Christian and Alexander. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I think to uh, kick this off, um, let's start with a short introduction around. So you can tell us a little bit better who you are and uh, what kind of role did you play in this uh, open school platform. So yeah. please go ahead. I can probably start. Um, so uh, I, my background is uh, I'm an entrepreneur and a, a programmer since I was eight uh, and uh, been Starting a lot of companies and helping helping a lot of clients with the digitalization and uh, also involved a lot in the tech sector uh, and running around, running a lot of hackathons and uh, uh, started a lot of companies. So uh, and I also have three kids. So last year uh, or we should probably start uh, nine years ago when we started hearing about this uh, new uh, big project uh, um, that was announced from the city. Uh, uh, but I, I'll, I'll uh, talk more about that after Alexander have, have introduced himself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Christian. And uh, hi again, Lena. Nice to be here. Yeah, so my name is Alexander Crawford, and I've lived in Sweden for 30 years. I'm not a developer. I'm not a programmer. I did a little bit of HTML maybe 25 years ago, but that's the extent of my of my IT or my developer knowledge. But I'm really interested in policy, in the debate about policy and about how to um, shape government government policy and local government policy around a range of issues and especially around tech and uh, digital. So for me, the open school platform was an opportunity to help the um, the real pioneers, the guys who built it and the, 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 the guys and women who built it. And uh, but also see how this project could be used to actually change the conversation, the broader conversation. Uh, and that's uh, maybe we can get back to that a little bit later. But I think it's good to begin with the story itself. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think it's very interesting to have uh, this uh, mix of background, you know, a more technical, but a more like policy oriented uh, background as well, because I'm also personally not uh, a developer or anything. I'm also more interested in the policy um, area. And I think this is uh, this is a cross 
supportive aid that we uh, all have to um, have. So thank you so much for that introduction. And as you, um, Alexander said, I think in order to understand the scale of the story, uh, we should have a little bit of background about the, the whole thing. Um, so Christian, perhaps uh, you could tell us a little bit about how the school platform that was provided by the city was and uh, what it was meant to be used for, and in general, what kind of issues you found along the way as a user, but later on as a developer. Yep. So I think it was 2000, 2013, uh, they started uh, with the announcement that now they're going to uh, uh, do something really, really great. <laughs> they, they invested or they had a budget for uh, 60 million uh, euros for a, for a huge digital platform for, for helping everyone in the schools in Stockholm. And, um, and the whole tech sector and all the programmers I know who are, who are reacting the same way. This is, this is not going to be ending well. This, this is a monolithic approach. They're going to uh, try to solve too much at the same time. Um, but they started anyway with this, and they procured uh, a couple of vendors for, for doing this. And uh, But during the time when they started developing this, uh, news came out from, uh, from, from the project uh, that it was delayed and it's going to be costing more. Uh, and I think it was 2018 they launched this. And uh, I have three kids, so I was on front seat uh, to, to, to see this failure of a launch because everything stopped working. It was really slow. Uh, you couldn't find anything. It was really bad UX. Uh, and, uh, but as we all know, when you have to have a little bit of patience when you, when you are seeing a new system launched in that scale. So, you know, one year passed by and then uh, a lot of security issues uh, were published that the, uh, some parents just tried to change some query parameters and, and we realized that this is, this is not even secure. So they have paid, paid a lot of money and they have uh, made a lousy job at doing it user friendly, but also a lousy job at doing it securely. So something uh, were obviously not right in this. Uh, and one more year passed by. So now we are at uh, uh, the autumn of uh, 2020. And uh, I got so frustrated because uh, my, my school um, or my children's school, they, the, the teachers were forced to use this platform, even though it didn't work at all. Uh, they, they, every information about the kids were sent through this platform. So I, every morning I had to log into this uh, and it was really, and it is still uh, really uh, uh, slow and it always crashes and you have to log out every time you change uh, between kids uh, and you can't really find anything. You, and it's, so I got so frustrated. So I, so I uh, started communicating uh, openly about my frustration and I realized that there's a lot of, lot of uh, parents that feel exactly the same way. Uh, which would be expected. But I also realized that the, the teachers in the school were also uh, really, really frustrated with this, this platform. So then I decided to start looking into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so I created uh, the first version of the app. Uh, I think it was precisely one year ago today, actually. <laughs> Um, and posted a picture and a small video of, of this uh, on social media and also published the source code and encouraged everyone else to, to join this and try to help building something that actually works. And, um, and this sparked a lot of, lot of hope, I think, uh, in the community that it's this, this is actually something we can solve because everyone has the same problem. Like you have to get this information you're so frustrated. This takes a lot of energy in your mornings and in your afternoons mm -hmm. and to use this platform because it's so, so hard to use. Uh, but also, you know how much money it was. This was already a discussion. When you know how much money it has, has costed, when you see how bad it is, then this is, this is a very e like an eerie feeling that you want to scratch or get rid of somehow. And, and obviously also do something about. So there was a lot of a uh, lot of um, uh, enthusiasm with uh, that we could find a way to, to solve this ourselves. Uh, so there were a couple of, of friends of mine, old colleagues that uh, new friends that that uh, jumped on board and started developing uh, and this app. And we developed an API and we we did a lot of a lot of work during uh, during Christmas holidays last year. Um, 
and then in February uh, we we started uh, communicating with media about this, and the media started in- getting an interest in this. And we also realized this is a, this is a huge thing. People are really interested in both this this problem and in understanding how much money and what the money is has been spent on. Uh, but also that there is a possibility uh, to do something about it. So this was this was already an interesting story before we even launched uh, the app. Um, but then we we launched the app uh, and uh, it directly became a success. It, it uh, was first on uh, on App Store on Google Play Store directly, uh, and it got uh, very good reviews. Even though that uh, when the app the first version i think was just like three functions it was really really basic but uh, those three functions really worked worked really well and, and fast and didn't have any bugs so so everyone started downloading this um and and then of course the city uh was uh, was uh, both uh, i think a little bit upset about <laughs> if we can solve this uh, during our, our Christmas holiday and they couldn't solve this for for nine years and uh, then it's a little bit embarrassing for them to, to do that um, but also they they wanted to to look at the legal perspective to see that this app was uh, was also legal and they they made some claims directly in media uh, which I think was not <laughs> Uh, very smart because they already presumed that this app was illegal, uh, even though they hadn't done any any proper research at that point. Um, so that was a little bit of a mistake, I think, and which probably forced them into continuing on that on uh, to have that position uh, uh, throughout this process. Um, but um, yeah, so that was, that was pretty much the whole story up until uh, we uh, started developing the app. Uh, and at that point, when we launched, uh, a lot of interest came also from from other uh, developers and also PR uh, companies and illustrators and uh, Alexander from a policy perspective, uh, legal interest. Uh, so at that point, we already had a Discord uh, with uh, I think it was twenty people uh, or something like that in the in the early weeks of uh, when we have when we have launched. Um, so yeah, this sparked the whole movement, you could say, uh, and and uh, you know we could talk a lot about the different lear- learnings and all the different the different events that happened after that. But uh, Alexander, what's from from your point of view? What what was your uh, reaction at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I I was an observer, um, and uh, Kristen, you and I have known each other for a long time, and you um, you vented your frustrations (laughs) repeatedly (laughs) and ongoingly with me. Um, But uh, from my perspective, already then in February, March, April, when this began to be talked about outside of narrow developer circles and outside of narrow kind of school politics or school policy in the city of Stockholm, it felt that, uh, or I reacted feeling, wow, I've been involved in so many, you know, policy dialogues and policy seminars and uh, conferences where there is a lot of talk about new digi- the new digital infrastructure and new digital landscape and how to build the un- infrastructure for, you know, for the 2020s and beyond. And behind all of that talk, um, or in contrast to all of that talk, this venture, this initiative was wasn't talk. It was actually a new tool. And the way in which a new tool really, really impacted the conversation. And of course, it didn't just happen. I mean, part of this kind of op- the Open School Platform and Collective, as you said, uh, Christian, there are some really, really good, um, you know, PR people and uh, even and you know legal people and all of those who really joined this project mainly because many of them are parents and have been mm. frustrated just like you had been for so many years and felt yeah, the least I can do is you know do- donate a few hours to the initiative. 
um, and my my kids are grown up, so I I was lucky enough to have them go through school before the school platform. Um, but I can very very much identify with the frustrations. But the way in which this has already back in you know March April started changing the uh, conversation, and since then of course, and especially I think culminating in the last month or last few weeks, uh, it's been just amazing to see how a little, little snowball has just escalated and, you know, is, without using too big words, is, is, you know, it's changing the conversation around public, well, civil, civic tech and, um, and you know, public digital, the digitalization of public sector. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 totally. It's very, it's very interesting to see how um, a lot of people think that proprietary software, because then you pay, it should work and it should be secure, and then it should, uh, uh, yeah, satisfy all the needs of every user. But in this case, we we can really see that that was not the case, and it is also quite interesting to see how. Um, I would say that because it was an open uh, platform, you know, everybody could join and then it became this, what you're saying, like this whole movement. Um, so I'm a little bit curious now, uh, Christian, because uh, since you, you you were the one developing, what drove you to release this as under a free software license? Like, did you, did you foresee this coming? Did you think this was going to bring people together and it will help you? Or yeah, just, uh, I, I I'm very curious to to know this. Yeah, so yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, but you have to also remember that uh, uh, my company that I work for uh, and that I founded, uh, Item, we we are only working with uh, open software ourselves um, as an open source, um, and most of our clients uh, in public sector, but also pretty much every customer we have in the private sector as well. Uh, understands the that open software actually is makes sense because you have you have so many more uh, potential eyes that will look at your code and if if you could divide uh, divide the, the cost of maintaining a lot of the code between other actors especially the parts that you aren't can aren't the part of your your core business but the rest of it like everything else if you can First of all, try to find something, uh, some open source software that that solves ninety percent of your problem. Uh, then it's much easier than you have to try to find, you know, develop something of your own. But when when you are developing something of your own, uh, why do you have to maintain that yourself if that's not part of your core uh, your your core business? Uh, so even f- our our private cu- customers are are interested in in using and utilization uh, of of open source as much as possible and and also from a political standpoint we have been trying to uh, trying to to start this conversation about uh, uh, how to how to explain <laughs> to kind of the public sector that this is not about cost uh, cost efficiency uh, but it's about openness and, and participation and, and democracy in a sense like we are uh, a lot of a lot of the people that are work in my company we are we have kind of some some sort of uh, philosophical idea on on, uh, on what type of society we are trying to build with our clients um, and um, uh, and and that's the, so so to me it, that was kind of the easiest way to do it and also i realized i'm not going to be able to do all this myself i need to you know involve a lot of other people so if i you know try to close this down as much as possible then you know in the end that's just going to be me trying to maintain something that's not going to be big uh, but rather um I try to to use the lessons learned from a, a TED talk called uh, "How to Start a Movement." Uh, so that was very key for me to that uh, that lo- those lessons um, and 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 that that the TED talk uh, I, I can recommend it to everyone. Uh, but it talks a lot about how the leader is not the most important part, but r- rather the first followers are are the key to to the movement. Because the rest will not follow the leader, the rest will follow the first movers, uh, the first uh, followers. So, 
I try to embrace as much as possible uh, everyone that jumped on board uh, directly, and and there was a lot of a lot of media interest and everything. So I try to we try to to do this as much as possible to to uh, be many people, not just me talking all the time. Um, and and also uh, uh, trying to and um, try to be as inclusive as possible uh, in regards to who can contribute. Uh, so uh, and also celebrate every contribution we got. Um, so a lot of lot of those like learnings on how to how to do something open uh, that we have been doing a lot of time. And this time we could do it with uh, kind of media intention as well, uh, which was really interesting. So we got an example now to really perfect uh, these different things that we think is is important when you start when you try to start something like this, because we have seen so many so many clients trying to do this uh, the wrong way, uh, or, and and also other projects that. They open an API, but and they publish a press release that they have an API, but then they they really don't are aren't interested in in the first users or kind of trying to start something start something bigger, and also other types of uh, open source um, uh, projects that you know uh, start working in the closed for two months and then when they're finished and they feel now it's ready to publish and they see the publication of open source as something big and they they are just expecting to for everyone to just jump on board and help them free and doing the work that that they so the a key difference here was to do it open from default like the first line of code is you could still still go back to seeing the first attempts that i did one year ago uh, that all of those things were were open from the beginning, which means that it's much easier for uh, for someone to be part of it to contribute with something very early on, which I think is is one of the key things when you are joining a movement that you feel that you are you can be a part of the in crowd if you are early. Uh, so a lot of psychology and a lot of lot of ideas that we have learned from the last uh, ten years or so. Uh, we we now got the opportunity to actually test them in 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 reality uh, when we had full control over it because most of the time we usually have a client and someone else that have a say in what we can do or not do, but in this case we already had one thing that we could we could actually control ourselves. So we tried to do it and and it turned out pretty well. So so yeah, that that was kind of the, the, the there was a lot of ideas and thoughts about how to do this right uh, and just in the beginning. And this uh, and and these uh, two co-founders, uh, Eric, uh, which was first, and then Johan Erbink, uh, both of them had the same ideas, and we have talked about this for a long time. So this was actually kind of a culmination of some a long discussion that we, uh, were already started a long long time before we we started doing this. Yeah, and also that I think um, that frustration that drove you to to you know t take one step ahead. Um, I think a lot of people could really identify with that because I mean uh, there is a lot of like parents uh, like you too that were going through the same thing. So uh, just the fact that it was open for them to also collaborate and to join. Uh, it is uh, it is it is wonderful and uh, you also mentioned something that it's very interesting and is that this the openness that a uh, free software license offers can actually help a lot not only to develop the the app and to improve it but also to identify this kind of box on this kind of security issues that there might there might be um, and to me it's so interesting to see how actually the city of Stockholm called illegal uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this platform when you were actually trying to help uh, to fix a security issue that you found and if I'm not mistaken uh, that for which the city of Stockholm had to pay a GDPR fine so perhaps Alexander um, what do you think like uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how did the developers and also the supporters of the open school platform handle this situation when the, they realized that this was not only a technical matter it was also involved in some legal and policy uh, aspects yeah <clears throat> thanks that's it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question um, and the the interesting thing was that um, without going into 
uh, without knowing exactly what, you know, Christian and Eric's and Yuan and the other very early developers, what was in their mind. But I, and I, but I think right from the start, your, the main instinct was to help, was to help parents uh, yeah. and being very clear that, you know, this project, this initiative is to help the parents. It's not to help the teachers. It's not bec because this isn't a teacher platform and it's not really to help this, the, 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 the pupils on their platform. Uh, but, you know, this is a group of parents getting together to help other parents in a spirit of, you know, positivity, if you like. What happened then quite early with the resistance that came, the strong resistance culminating, of course, in, um, you know, the, uh, in a, a police um, or, you know, a police investigation and, and, you know, complex legal issues. That, of course, increased the, let's say, you know, the um, animosity almost, you could say, of the open school platform against, and this is where it gets interesting because it's it's not really, uh, one, well, you, you have to, well, think a little bit about and know a little bit about how uh, big um, public sector digital projects are decided and financed and managed and carried out usually how it's been done in the past and um, in Sweden as in many countries you have a few politicians sitting as politicians deciding you know the main strategies and the main policies and then you have a group of civil servants uh, who've usually been there a long time uh, and the politicians the politicians come and go the civil servants remain and then you have vendors you have you know, well, you have the suppliers, you have the com the companies who are produce who are um, providing the the, um, the project the, the the solutions, and the key in this case was that they almost inadvertently managed to get the Open School Platform Collective to be against all three of these stakeholders of all three of these groups so the politicians and you know you christian and others began of course having conversations with the politicians uh and uh but then it became quite obvious that the politicians only had so much agency about these issues and it fell a lot to the civil servants and the legal department and the cio cdo's of the both of the city of stockholm as a whole and of the school uh, the school system in Sweden, schools are managed at the municipal level. In other countries, it's national. So, but but still, Stockholm is a big municipality, and there are many, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of kids, school kids, and um, and 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 parents. So it's you know, it's a big corporation, if you like. And then, of course, the vendors. And then you get into the whole issue of public procurement and how do you buy, you know, how do you uh, manage proc procurement of these kinds of uh, projects? And all of this came up to the surface in such an interesting way. And that really helped to kind of uh, get a lot of people, including myself, yeah, I would. I did not know the details, the intricacies of public procurement of big digital platforms. Uh, you know, six months ago, um, and I kind of assumed that. Well, yeah, that probably worked. Works quite well. It's um, you know the 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 the, the public servants um, will just like they um, they use public procurement for you know all other municipal services. I guess they will you know use it wisely in this case. And you discover no, they don't. And you would think that well, public procurement in Europe means that there is a functioning market and that uh, players of various sizes, from the big corporations to the small startups like the company that you run. Christian are all able to uh, compete on a level playing field for being part of these things and you discover no 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 that's not at all the case um and you know there are a handful of very 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 large vendors who have dominated have cornered this market and keep it you know forever and ever uh, and throughout this whole year, the whole question of so you know what are the actual relationships between the vendor and the public servants and the you know how and you know without going into all the details of all the different inquiries, um, you know there there's really no we couldn't find any emails between the vendors and the city of Stockholm for this you know hundred million euro project. So that means well, how do they communicate? Um, so it, it was it was just a very very, very rapid kind of learning journey into procurement of large digital solutions, which then in turn 
uh, kind of awakens the broader question, which is, okay, now we're now that we're supposed to be building an infrastructure for, you know, a digital society or a digitalized society. What are the principles behind that infrastructure? Who should be doing what? Is it the case that the city of Stockholm should do everything? Of course not. They didn't do everything when it's about physical infrastructure, like, you know, water and sewages and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They do something and then there's a clear, clear line and say beyond this, it's up to you know, others to do it. And we provide the interoperability and we provide the, the interfaces uh, or, you know, to put it in these terms, we we provide the APIs and then it's up to it, it's up to others to develop their the solutions that they feel uh, are the most um, are the most interesting. So uh, but uh, that um, I guess in a way the 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 resistance of the city of Stockholm at both political level and, and civil servant level kind of energized kept energizing the open school platform movement there were times when oh, it felt heavy wouldn't you say christian i mean there were times yeah. you know when the police come and visit you that's then yeah. you kind of wonder of hey, hey come on <laughs> we, we, you know, how, far, how far should we go but mm. at the same time it did energize and it meant that more and more people uh, joined people who don't have kids in stockholm people who don't even live in Stockholm's developer all across Sweden joined um, and then of course leading to the perhaps the, the coming step in this whole process other municipalities outside of Stockholm saying well you know maybe we shouldn't make the same mistakes that Stockholm is doing maybe we should make sure that when we develop our you know school platform or whatever other digital platform for other civil uh, public sector services let's do it in a smart way let's make sure there are APIs and uh, and in some cases the solution that was developed for Stockholm will most probably be used in other um, municipalities in handshakes and welcoming and almost embraces between the political level, the civil servants in the city, and the developer community. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Go I, ahead. I, I, I just want to. I just want to add one more thing to uh, to to uh, the idea of openness and the and the brilliance of that in public sector because as we said the if the city of stockholm would have had a different mindset from the beginning they would definitely have seen this as a as a the the perfect uh, way to solve their problems like okay so here's a bunch of parents that have built one thing and we have all the other municipalities in sweden that are, that also have the similar problems um and this could be kind of the start of something new uh and uh, and the, the rest of the municipalities are looking at this in that way so they are they are actively now collaborating with us to try to see how can we make sure that the, uh, this app that we have developed, developed in Stockholm also is compatible with with the uh, you know, school plot platform in Gothenburg? And we are doing a lot of work to kind of divide the, the code in a way so it's, it's going to be really easy for every municipality to do their own adapter. So the, the same uh, the user interface could be used uh, in many different uh, municipalities. But also not in uh, only in Sweden. Uh, the app is now translated to, into I think it's fifteen languages. Uh, so it's in, Dan in Danish and uh, Norwegian and uh, English, of course, and French and Italian and uh, and also Arabic and uh, Somali and uh, I think it's Japanese or, uh, and also wow. Latin. So so the, the the app is already published uh, in in many different languages. So now we actually have a start of a movement that could be in much larger than just for, for the city of Stockholm, but also the municipalities in Sweden. Now we have something that if you are, if you listen to this and if, if you're a developer and you're equally frustrated with your school platform and are a parent, then you could actually do an adapter if you live in Amsterdam or if you live in Paris or wherever and, and do the similar thing. And, and, you, and that way you could also show uh, by doing the potential of of this movement this this idea of openness uh, and which is uh, from my perspective looking at kind of where europe are uh, in the terms of in the terms of global economy 
we have we have United States, we have China, and they they all have really big tech companies that are competing with each other. And but Europe, we don't have that many uh, uh, tech companies in that level, so we can't really compete with them in size. But I think if we can spark a movement of openness and collaboration and embrace the, the, the European Union and the ideas of, of, of why the EU started in the first place, if we can make sure to use openness as our competitive advantage and do much better collaboration between each other, instead of just waiting for the, for the public sector to, to start doing and, and giving us allowance to do this, we could actually make sure that we show them that this is possible without them telling us to do it but uh, or asking for permission to do it but rather just do it because as we we show now in sweden is that this police investigation and all these all these privacy washing uh, 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 tri- uh you know uh, propaganda if you would say uh were ineffective uh, that just helped us to get more traction and more interest and and in the end uh, once we uh, once they understood the principles in which we have developed this app where all the information that the, the app is is gathering is on, not stored elsewhere it's just stored on your device uh, which means that we are not liable for any any action that the the app is is or or any information we can't really see with us as developers we can't see any of the information and once you start using those principles which is basically privacy by design the G, what's said in the first sentence of of uh, of gdpr if you just follow those rules and the the design principles of gdpr and you do it in an open way so everyone can can look at the code and, and make sure that you are doing it right there are so many different potentials of of these types of apps in healthcare in in uh, in the transport business and uh, and to tackle all the problems with climate change um a lot of lot of uh, uh, different things in record in in terms of procurement itself like all the different aspects that are that feels wrong in society right now that it's going too slow there are these types of opportunities where you can start developing something for yourself uh, to solve one problem uh, for you and then st- publishing the code and doing exactly what we did uh, and and if we start seeing those type of movements we can start seeing a lot of lot of potential for europe to start b- being so much more collaborative and effective but also uh, competitive in terms of the global mm-hmm. economy. So I think this 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 could be, and hopefully we could spark this that type of movement for this example. Yes, yes, certainly. And uh, actually, that's one of our ideas uh, exactly with this interview is to highlight this um, example so other administrations can actually, you know, see and uh, avoid uh, falling on uh, on the mistakes that uh, unfortunately the city of Stockholm made of not seeing the potential of the openness that this platform had and how it could help to improve the existing platform. And also, as you mentioned, uh, the option of like like interoperate with other uh, cities, you know, the co- of collaboration with other cities, other countries. And it's very interesting what you just uh, share with us that uh, there is some collaboration started like already taking place. Um, and hopefully in the future, uh, other cities of Sweden or other countries can actually reuse this platform and actually save some money, avoid some vendor locking. And as uh, you also mentioned, let uh, free software, small and medium enterprises to compete in a market that has been, you know, run for by the big uh, corporations. Um, so coming back a little bit to 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 the case of the um, of the legal issue, like the data protection issue and so on. Uh, I just find this case so fascinating. So I've been following a little bit, and if I'm if I I read that the, actually the city of Stockholm made an official statement, and it some how in a way uh, said that they will let you get access to this data within the system but with a condition that 
that it will be like external providing, uh, providers setting up the license for you, uh, namely the open school platform and the city. So could you like, um, yeah, maybe you both uh, tell me a little bit about this uh, decision uh, and what do you think, uh, like, do you think it will uh, undermine the openness of the platform or it will improve it or what are your thoughts about this, um, um, like, recent decision? Yeah, I think I think one one big part of the story has not been solved yet, um, and because and that's that's money um, and business model. Uh, I think uh, I, I think so far we have we haven't like reimbursed anyone helping us with the, developing this this platform, um, but we really from the start we we felt that to do this correctly and do it in a way that people can can expect that it actually continues to work even you know when media attention has been falling off uh, um we wanted to make sure that we have some sort of of business model so we have some sort of money coming in so we can reimburse everyone that wants to, wants to help out um but still we also wanted to make sure that there was was uh, cheap enough so everyone could use it and and uh, pay for pay for the app. So right now it, it costs uh, one euro to download. Um, but the the but that's that's of course something that um, would be better if if somehow we could finance this uh, because it's a public effort. This is something that would would need to be free at some point. Um, but that, then you kind of get to the point where where you don't really know uh, and you can't really expect that this that this should work even in two years from now. And it, it's a lot of initiatives that I've been seeing that are starting really well, but then you know start the, the interest from the founder and the original contributors are falling off. So after a while, it just becomes stale. But what we wanted to show was something that could continue growing and continue to be better and better and, and have some sort of sustainable business model uh, attached to it. So uh, the city of Stockholm, they had a really good idea, I think, was uh, to, to license uh, this so that the parents didn't have to pay it them by themselves, but the school would uh, or the city would pay instead of the parents. Uh, so that was the, the main idea. But what they didn't uh, do uh, was to to pick up a calculator and understand that this actually costs a lot of money if they if they want to do this. So when we finally just you know uh, realized what they were asking for and we sent them the offer, they just said this is this is too expensive. So they didn't kind of do the math before before promising out loud that this is something they're going to do. So what they did, and, and the effect of that was that uh, instead of helping us, they just actually just uh, made things worse. Because if you know that the app is going to be free in in two months, then you're not going to buy it, download it or and buy it now. So you just you know force the, the users out from our, our platform and waiting for 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 them to approve it and and pay for it. So. Uh, so that was another thing that they did wrong. They they should have you know investigated this and have some sort of discussion about prices. And then after we have came to a conclusion, then they could have gone out to the media and said, "This is this is what's going to happen." So that was another mistake that they did. But in the end, there's still no kind of really good way of handling these type of of uh, open. Or, or financing these type of open uh, projects uh, without either you know getting paid from the users themselves, or getting some sort of uh, like state uh, uh, innovation funds, Vinova and things like that, or in like in they suggested get the the actual uh, city that is it's the the one that probably should pay for these type of services uh, and find a way for them to start paying for this. So that's still an open question, and I'm 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 hoping that some of the other municipalities will have easier uh, to try to solve this uh, in a in a kind of more um, uh, flexible way than the city of Stockholm was doing. Yes, um, Alexander, would you like to add something here? Yeah, I I think what, what's um, what's important and what became 
clear was the need for basic knowledge and you know information about how these kinds of things work um it felt like uh, i mean the, the what happened when the city of stockholm decided to try to look for another model procurement model basically for the school platform um it became f- clear quite quickly that that was a political decision that wasn't really anchored in among you know in the organization itself so the the political leadership was quick to say of course we want to contribute to the creation of an ecosystem of developers who can you know etc cetera, etc cetera, and we welcome the open school platform and uh, and uh, we've together with our you know legal team and procurement team we think we've found a solution to do that except just like christian said there was as far as we know there was no budget allocated uh and no budget allocated and the or the money that was maybe allocated was nowhere near the huge public procurement of the of the large uh large vendors um and that meant yet again that something that has the potential of having a real or and has had a real positive impact in the daily lives of families is kind of relegated to being almost like a you know a, a little humanitarian project or an, a non-profit that works you know somewhere out at the edges doing something good but you know far away from the big machinery of local government and it's that philosophy that that you need to attack and somehow change because without changing that there won't be any funding available uh, for anyone but the large vendors and the ones mm. who can make it through the huge procurement um uh, the, the procure, procurement procedures um and hopefully uh the open school platform will be a little bit of a um, eye opener for others maybe not the ones who have been you know spending the last 12 months trying to you know basically kill the open school platform uh initiative but for others in other municipalities and for others in stockholm and in you know 10 months it's or 9 months it's local elections in stockholm and hopefully uh the election campaign at the local level when you're talking about so what do we want for the schools in stockholm it's not only a question of curriculum and and class sizes and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, but it's also things that you know well it would also be good and hopefully some party will come out and say well you know part of our campaign is also to make sure that the digital tools for parents are as good as possible and are developed in a modern kind of forward leading way that will um, ensure that we can you know keep keep them updated keep them uh, cutting edge uh, without uh, falling into um, you know sort of f- five or seven year contracts with huge vendors yeah and also yeah. and I just want to add in, into that debate also not only financing uh, these things but also making sure that the APIs they have in the city are open because uh, this shouldn't have to be a political issue because the city have already decided in 2017 that before the last election that you know the, the APIs should be open and they have a strategy to use uh, collab- collaborate between the the city and entrepreneurs to to try to gather as much as possible from all the programmers that are already working here and you have to remember in stockholm you have the the most common job in in stockholm is to be programmer that's above everything else <laughs> Uh, because of our huge tech sector because uh, so we have you know i i, I think it was 67 or oh, 6 billion euros in 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 vc capital uh just during this year coming like money coming into to sweden in uh, to for to help all the v or all the startups to to grow which means, you know, and all the startups are in in the tech sector. So, so that just means that you know we have a lot of lot of programmers, a lot of tech uh, 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 competence here. So, we already have the competence. Now we just have to bridge that over to help also the the the, the public sector in, in the digitalization space. 
Yes, exactly. Like, kind of to promote this synergy of uh, uh, promoting local economy and uh, also like saving uh, a cost in the public sector with uh, public procurement and also avoiding vendor lock-ins and yeah. just making a more collaborative ecosystem uh, in terms of uh, digital infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This story is very is very interesting, and just uh, just to draw to a close, and um, I I, I kind of already got a little bit of the feeling of what your perspective is, but just uh, to to wrap this up, um, you working um, for and own a free software solution. What do you think is the biggest challenge that administrations uh, have nowadays to modernize uh, their digital infrastructure with public code? And and in general, what would be your advice uh, for those who want to work on free software solutions in the future? I can take the first question and you can take the quest the second, Christian, maybe. Sounds great. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that the first the answer to the first question is just, you know, just competence, just learning, just understanding how it works. That it it is the case for a citizen, and I think even more so for a public publicly elected official to know something about you know the the digital world how it works what are the key principles what's you know how how does how should one think about these kinds of things um so and how do you change how do you you know level up the level of competence in among our public uh, publicly elected officials you know, it's it's like we've done in so many other areas in the past, you know, years and decades and, you know, centuries. You just, it takes time, but uh, uh, the, there's a need of an alliance of the people in the sector. And then you need, the, you know, the journalists to start asking questions about that. And inside the parties themselves, the few people who know something about that need to be able to go up stairs to the party leadership and say, hey, guys, we really need to think through the digital part of our party program or of our you know, election platform. Um, and um, and uh, we need to, you know, talk to people like, you know, like, like Christian and have um, have um, contact with organizations such as yours to to to, to, to learn more about this. So that's uh, that's that's my easy cop out answer. <laughs> More competence. <laughs> I think it's very good, actually. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think we need to we need to understand that this is this has been uh, two two shifts. One shift that came uh, like in the eighties and nineties, where we got computers and software and tried to move from paper to to kind of documents inside of a computer and starting sending emails and office packages and and printers and all of that that's that's the kind of the it revolution but then in 95 when the web came along uh, that sparked um, its own revolution and that's what the next phase is about so when people and especially as politicians are talking about digitalization i think that the, in their minds they already think that they have control over this because that's what they have been doing for the last 20 years. They have been doing computerization. Like they have installed computers everywhere and they have web browsers and they have you know, office packages and SharePoints and, and uh, a lot of, lot of tools within the IT sphere. But the, you know, what the tech sector is about and the, the changes, the disruptive changes for, to society uh, those things are oblivious to them. I don't. I don't think that they see them in a way, in the same way as the rest of the society is doing. So I think this is a gap between the private sector and the tech sector, and also the IT sectors, because there's a lot of vendors that are now thriving in the kind of the the, the golden era or the the, the 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 remainder of the IT sector, because there's a lot of a lot of contracts, there's a lot of collaborations, you have a lot of lot of relationships, and you're, they are stuck in that in that era. And what the politicians need to do is to understand how can we move the society and the, and the public sector over to the I, not from the IT era over to the internet era, and try to understand what's what's the playing rules in that era. And and because that's where Facebook is, that's where Spotify is, that's where 
where Baidu is and um, and Tencent and all the other players that are not stuck in SharePoint or or vendors in that size. They they are they are trying to to force network effects over to to society and try to bridge those finding those those small hurdles in uh, how to make their their products better and better at con- a continuous rate. And that's not what you get when you have this type of politics in the public sector. And and so going back to Alexander's point, that means in effect that you have to switch place for a lot of people. You have to bring in more more people from the tech sector into this conversation, uh, but also into these organizations that you control, that you are in charge of. You have to make sure that they think in kind of the internet era's uh, mindset of continuous development, continuous improvement, continuous delivery. Those type of questions are should, should be strategical uh, uh, discussions in all the different uh, agencies that you have in society. And if you don't have those, then you are stuck in kind of the old era and you are eventually going to be be just cost more and more costly and more, less and less effective. And and in the end, you're going to be, be thrown out by these type of, of uh, initiatives that we can re- represent. We are a disruptive force to to force the discussion, but also the government agencies and the, the municipalities to start thinking in new ways. Yeah, and the good yeah. thing, and the good thing is that parents are actually helped every morning by that solution as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that is true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And uh, we as FSFE, we are also trying to to educate people around, you know, the free software because we still believe that there is a lot of uh, myths and misunderstandings around these uh, new solu- solutions um, that could actually bring a lot of uh, good things um, in terms of uh, digital infrastructure and use in general, like for digital buys. Every time we're going a little bit more digital. Um, okay, yeah, thank you so much uh, for uh, to, for you too for being here today. Um, I really think this is a perfect case that portrays in a very good way how some issues such as uh, security risks, vendor lock-ins, um, a lack of technical support can actually be avoided and also fixed with free software solutions. Um, yeah, so thank you once again for being here. It was a very nice chat and it was a pleasure to have you both here. Here. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Bye.